it's okay. Yeah. Can I introduce you? I will, of course, of course, of course. Good evening and welcome, everybody. There are several new faces here who are here because of Charles and who don't know why we do what, why we do, what we do. So I thought that since you don't know us, I'll introduce the space, which is Gyan Prava Mumbai, which seeks to facilitate critical thinking in the arts. Through courses, lectures, seminars, conversations, and performances, we offer a platform to engage with works and a window to the current works of theory and practice. The objective is to bring about informed dialogue and discussions to enable us to think critical, think art. Since we opened in July 2007, we have presented over 200 public programs and our courses, which now of which are four in number, have been attended by over 500 participants. Currently, we have about 100 students studying with us. I'm happy to announce a partnership with South Asia Institute of Columbia University, whose faculty will be visiting us and teaching several courses. This partnership will be launched mid-December with Professor Akil Bilgrami, who will be conducting a three session seminar, actually six lectures, on secular, secularism, and enchantment. One of our cutting edge initiatives is called Creative Processes, under which we invite practitioners to share their work, their doubts, and impulses, giving us an understanding of the oeuvre in their language, in the first person, unmediated by critics, curators, and historians. Under this rubric, this year, William Kentridge, Shiroze Hushiari, Malavika Sarukai, and Maximo Gonzalez have shared the creative processes to packed houses and critical acclaim. Today, we have the internationally renowned architect and thinker, Charles Courier, who will take us through his trajectory, highlighting his important career markers. The entrance to cave number one at Elephanta has a profound pairing in the form of Yogeshwar Shiva and Natesha Shiva. One still as a flame, an exemplary form of stasis, and the other dancing the cosmos in and out of existence, a dynamis. This stillness and movement is an indicator for the absorption of these two sim experiences simultaneously so that the whole can be sensed. We often see only fragments, but can and do sense the whole. This, to my mind, would be the purpose of architecture, which unfolds frame by frame in space and time. Who better to give us the tools to experience wholeness than Charles Courier, whose principal concerns have encompassed the ritualistic pathway, the empty center, open to sky spaces or non-building, and the overarching principle of architecture as metaphor. Charles's recent exhibition at the headquarters of the Royal Institute of British Architects in London was a tribute to a stupendous career which began in 1958. It also celebrated the creation of the Korea archives after his bequest of about 6,000 models, photographs, and films, the single largest gift by a non-British architect. The Wall of Fame now sports, in its panel of recipients of the Reba Gold Medal, Charles Courier, the only name from India. We have much to be proud of and cherish. Here is an Indian, a Bombay Wala, a dear friend, and, a, and amidst us today. Charles will speak about his work and his thoughts, which will be followed by a film titled Into the Unknown, made on his much acclaimed recent creation, Champali Moor Center in Lisbon. A conversation between Sankalp Meshram, the director of the film, and Charles will follow. And I hope that all of us in the audience will have time to interact with this profound thinker after that. Ladies and gentlemen, 
please join me in welcoming Mr. Charles Correa and inviting him to address us. Thank you, thank you very much for all those generous things. <laughs> uh, when Rashmi asked me to speak, it was difficult because usually I speak to architects or students of architecture, or otherwise it's a general lecture to the public. Um, but this is the first time I've tried to give such a th uh, talk, which is about what is the process through which we design a building. It's, it's very important, I think, that the public understands. Um, to begin with, I thought rather than speak in generalities, I'll take you through a particular project. But to get to that project, I'll have to try and explain a little bit of the thoughts which went in through my head through the other projects I did on my way there. Now, the first thing I should say is that there's there's a big difference between construction and architecture. We use the word architecture in India very, very loosely. Everything in Gurgaon is architecture. Why is it so bad? You know, there's so much writing done, but is it E.M. Foster? Is it whatever? There's a difference between literature and writing. There's also a difference between construction and architecture, which most civilized cities, if not countries, understand. They don't mix it up, and we do here. And um, I think Corbusier put it very well. He said, the purpose of construction is to hold things together. The purpose of architecture is to move us. And he said even better, more vividly, he said, um, stones are dead things lying in quarries, but the apses of St. Peter's are a passion. That's beautiful. That means you take inert material, like stones, like brick and steel, and you infuse them. You go, you go to Fatehpur Sikh, you go to any of these places, the temple at Kailash, look at the passion in that, in that work and what it takes to put that in. So, having said that, I'll now try and take you through, but I want to put this caveat. When I said all this, I don't mean that architecture is an abstraction, no. A building must work. It has a purpose. All design has a purpose. And this is where we part company with the painters who, if they're, if they're too useful, they feel they, are, they have sold out. <laughs> Picasso, for instance, a, a great sculptor like Noguchi who designed a coffee table, brilliant, it's a piece of sculpture. They thought less of him, the critics, because Henry Moore would never design a coffee table. <laughs> you must understand the snobbery that goes on where artists are considered higher than someone who's actually useful, and especially in the art tradition of craftsmen. Of course, we must open that door. And um, it's, it's, not, it's, it's something we have to think about why, why this happens. Now, so a building must work. There's no question about that. It, must, it has a purpose, and to me at least, it becomes interesting when it goes beyond that purpose when it expresses something, other, other more metaphysical values. <laughs> Here is the Kund at Modera. You all know this. It's about 30 or 40 miles north of Ahmedabad. Has everyone been there? Yeah, it's worth going right now, <laughs> this evening. But it's fantastic. You see, on a, on a practical level, it's just a tank, a water tank. And what's very, very clever about it, of course, is that it's a place for pilgrims to bathe. And as the, as the monsoon, when the monsoon comes, it fills up. But as the, as the dry weather sets in and the water recedes, you, you can perform the same rituals at lower and lower levels. So those steps are not just abstract sculpture. They're tremendously intelligent, functional use. And all these kuns have that quality. So. But then it's much more than that. Even now, I haven't begun to describe it. You know, just to dig into the earth is primordial, to go in search of water. That's what you're looking at. And it moves you, whether you 
think about it or analyze it, somewhere in your deep in your stomach, you know that this is, you know, water is the giver of life, and as someone said, it's the taker of life. It's very basic to us. And then, of course, there's the empty center. So if the, if the, if the temple at Modera is a model of the cosmos, this is like an inverse model of the cosmos into the earth. And now, lastly, it's open to sky. That means you have something which is called the axis of the universe set up between the earth and the sky above, which exists in, in everything. Going back to the Pantheon, it goes way before that to the, the, the Greeks, to the Pantheon in Rome, you know that building. It exists everywhere. Every, every human culture has imagined this connection between the earth and the sky. That is what, when architecture begins to deal with these issues, but naturally, I don't think you can force it. These people didn't force it. They were just doing something so primordial and so basic that it got this expression. So, so that's really important that a mythic image like this is much, much deeper than just what we seem to see. We are, it stirs in us. Um, it's, it's wonderful. There was a chap called Gaston de Bachelard who wrote a brilliant book on, on science. He was a member of the French Academy. And then he wrote one book on art at the age of 60. He stopped writing for 10 years. And because art is so different, he said art, science is cause and effect. He said art is not cause and effect. You can't say, oh, because that was brown, I made this black. He said it's like a depth charge which explodes in your subconscious and sends to the surface the debris of recognition. We don't even know why we recognize this, but this is doing so many things to us. Here's another mythic image, the guru in the forest, very basic. It's education, of course. It's the guru and his chelas. It's basic, not just in India, everywhere in, in Asia, I think, in Africa too. Now, the, the symbol of education in North America is the little red schoolhouse. It has totally different implications. First of all, the weather, so they have to close it. But secondly, it has quite a different, I don't know how to say, ambiance. So that, I mean, I know I can get educated here, but I don't know if I can get enlightened. I know under an open sky, you would get enlightenment. And that's what the kund is playing in your mind. It's under God's sky. Now, this open to sky space is very, very important in housing because especially at every level, at very rich people want a lawn and this. But really poor people, when they have a courtyard or a terrace, you double the one room they have, they can get two rooms. And it's the second room has this wonderful quality of connecting with other things. So I, at least all the housing I've done, I've tried to use that, rich or poor. You, you have to realize it's, it's primordial, you, it, it's very basic. Uh, what I'm describing is different attitudes which I, you pick up as you go through life. I'm sure that's true of painters and writers and stuff. Um, you know, there's something called uh, the snail. As it moves along, the snail is inching along and then goes this way and then goes that way. And uh, there's a word for that trail. I, I read it once. It's a scientific word, but I forgot it. And no scientist can tell me what it is. But it was a very nice art, uh, essay. And it said, if you study that trail, you learn about the snail. So I think artists are like that. You do random things, seemingly random. But slowly, they're beginning to form. They're going to form a kind of connecting. So one of the things which. I was, I think all of us in India, we want to find an Indian architecture. We want to know what architecture could be in India. No, our problem is really that all architecture as we know it today, including modern architecture, goes back to this very simple diagram of the Parthenon, which was one of the original icons of Europe, of Greece, as you know. And so, the Greeks did not think that man should imitate nature. It wasn't like Art Nouveau where you make leaves and stuff. No, 
a, a, a building is man-made, nature is separate, and you have a dialogue between man and nature. That's essential. In fact, that was followed by the Romans after them. Then came Palladio and the thing, and finally all the way down to Corbusier. Now, if you're a European and you're coming down this road, is this this way or this? I don't know which way this is. Oh, sorry. You're coming down this road and you come all the way to Corb. If to find an Indian architecture, I can't turn left. Or to find Japanese, turn right. I've come down quite a different road than perhaps what exists here. I don't know what exactly that is, but that is what we should search for. But I knew, I know it's not that. In fact, if I see, for instance, the caves in Ajanta, they are not destroying the hill or dominating it, but they're not leaving it alone. It's a very ambiguous relationship, and that's what's typically Hindu and Buddhist, that you don't have this simple dichotomy between man and nature and good and whatever, on and on. So I thought to myself, what would happen if you came down such a path? And um, this was the important building bricks in my head, the snail's trail, I mentioned it. And I thought, what would that be? And I thought it would be something more like a non-building, which isn't the object on the hill, but actually, on the, on the contrary, it's a kind of energy field you move through. And one of the ones I did long ago in 75 in Bhopal to 81 was Bharat Bhavan, where you enter there and there's nothing to see because it's just behind these walls which you walk past. You go down these courtyards. There's a lake out there. You enter and you go down this courtyard and then you can go through into the next courtyard. What has happened to this? Yeah, I think it's not working. Is it working? Try it again. One day I just point. Oh, thank you, yeah, you got it? Ah, perfect. And you go down and you can go in here and then you can go down and further down. And in each of these places, there are these caves. I'm calling them caves. I mean, they're rooms, they're huge rooms which have different collections of tribal art, of contemporary art, of, of uh, theater, all kinds of things, and workshops. <laughs> but basically, you're going under open to sky space. And that loosens you up considerably. Th this is a section through it. Oh, sorry, one second. You see, as it, go it goes on stepping down as you go down to the, to the wa water which is down here. That's the walls you go by. And that's the water ahead of you. So you know where you're going, but you're not work, work, uh, moving towards uh, uh, an object. Then if you look into one of these spaces which you can access, some of, many of you may have been there, then of course you get these collections, and that's a regular exhibition space or museum. But the idea of moving through, to me, was very important. And I just did this intuitively. I'd done it before. Much later, I learned about the production and all the importance of the, the movement through that. Is, of course, the idea of moving around on a, on a sacred, on a ritualistic pathway is basic to all cultures. It's not just in Hinduism. It's not just in the stupa. It's, um, it's in the Kaaba, in Islam. It's in Christianity, the, the, the novenas going around the cathedrals. <clears throat> this is, I put in a small movie clip, so you'll understand that you can't photograph this building. In fact, I think Sankal went to photograph it and he said, it's, it's empty center, how can you photograph what isn't there? <laughs> Which is really true. How, how do you do that? And that's the trouble in architecture because what gets publicized and what gets is the image which you can see in a magazine or a newspaper. That means it's basically just a, a pattern that's going down to the water. But what's nice about this is that it's actually a public garden and people come there for the garden and then they go for one or two. We don't have the equivalent in Bombay, we should. They don't even have it in Delhi. Delhi, you have to jump in a car to go to Triveni or something. These people come on a scooter. It's right in the, in the city. Now, 
this idea of the of the ritualistic path, we started with one of my first projects. This is the Gandhi Memorial Museum. I think many of you may have seen it. It's in Ahmedabad. And here we've got the, you can see the roofs there. Then if I take the roofs off, you can see that some of the places are enclosed. Gosh, none of these things work. I'm sorry. Maybe you should pay your rent or something. <laughs> I know. I know. Actually, these are made in China. OK. <laughs> But anyway, you can, you can see that. The yellow shows where the units are enclosed with, but uh, for keeping letters and books, etc. But really, it shows you how you can go. This is Gandhiji's life. It was a journey. That's through, the, through Ahmedabad. He came back. The first one was South Africa. And then finally, he's, he gets killed. And then he triumphs. That was his house, as you all know. Okay, really? Which one? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Not that I need it. But anyway, now you see it's, it's tiled roofs, brick, <laughs> stone floors, etc. And I tried to use the same thing, but in a contemporary voice. Now I'm going to make a lot of enemies in this room. But I don't think heritage means that you make a cartoon version of the past. That's terrible. You must, you must speak. Am I in the way? No, I don't oh. Know. oh, 